And uh, what we're doing today is a little different from what we, uh, as a medical community, were doing uh, some months ago. So it's a good time to review what we've learned and I'm thankful for this esteemed panel. So some of the major themes that we observed from our case discussions and the experience of the intensivists on this panel include the management of uh, acute coronary syndrome in an ICU COVID positive patient. What's the differential? What are the management choices? Uh, immune modulatory agents like tocilumab or TOSI, what are the indications of therapy and timing? Rendesivir and other antiviral agents, what are the indications when and how to use it? Steroids, I think this uh, be, and news will review that. Fluid management of intensive care patients who are COVID positive and uh, renal protection and renal replacement therapy. Non-invasive ventilatory support. So what are the paradigm changes in this modality and issues around it? Therapeutic plasma exchange versus convalescent plasma. What are the criteria and evidence? So some, uh, and of course, huge issues with anticoagulation and uh, phenomenon of DIC in critically ill COVID patients. What is the role of laboratory investigations, imaging, point of care, ultrasound, and decision-making? And when does a patient not respond to any measures, what, is, what are the next steps? What is the role for actor? So a lot to discuss. I'm not sure we'll cover all of that, but uh, one of the things that um, came out of a discussion with an institution in Pakistan was presentation of a patient who was in his 50s with COVID-19 pneumonia admitted to um, an intensive care unit uh, with high inflammatory markers. And on the third uh, day three, he developed chest pain and ST elevation with tachycardia. And there were biomarkers of uh, elevated troponins which suggested an acute myocardial infarction. So uh, criteria for ST segment elevation this patient was managed with a non-invasive acute coronary syndrome protocol and therapeutic plasma exchange in that institution and with improvement to discharge. But there was a lot of interesting discussion on that point and uh, how to best manage patients who have who present with uh, ST elevation or other features of acute coronary syndrome. So this is a case pre series presented by of about six hospitals in the New York uh, City area, which uh, presented uh, several cases, I think a total of about 18 cases. Uh, this is a case report, but it's very illustrative. And some of the things that are important to um, to notice are that there were out of the 18, eight cases had myocardial infarction and 10 did not have, uh, it had non-coronary non myocardial injury. And the other characteristics which were interesting was that the, the patients who did not have my, uh, myocardial infarction or occlusive myocardial infarction had some differences in their EKG findings. They had diffuse ST elevation rather than focal or um, targeted to certain leads. And also in the, in the echocardiogram, they had um, what appeared to be global dysfunction and not regional wall motion abnormality. So that gave a certain clue with bedside evaluation that these patients had non-occlusive disease. And that is a very interesting question. Why does it happen? So there are several proposed mechanisms. Uh, of course, the classic type one myocardial infarction has uh, plaque rupture as a, majority, uh, as a major component of its pathophysiology. But in the patients with COVID-19, 
critically ill with uh, hypoxemia, cytokine storm, there can be coronary spasm, uh, a thrombotic state with microthrombi, direct endothelial or vascular injury, and uh, uh, myocardial edema, which has been demonstrated in, uh, by MRI uh, as well. So in, uh, in June, this, uh, this is a series of articles that comes every week in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is particularly illustrative, and it was also reviewed in the Journal of American College of Cardiology as a means of the discussion points around uh, managing COVID-19 patients who have acute coronary or myocardial uh, complications. And again, these uh, physicians uh, kind of address the dilemma of when a STEMI is strongly suspected, how do you weigh the benefits of emergency, uh, you know, the, high, the, the recommendations of percutaneous coronary intervention and revascularization against the risk of an invasive procedure in a critically ill patient with COVID-19. So these are some of the things before you take them to the cath lab to consider. And if you do think that you have substantial myocardium at risk and you can salvage it, then of course, PCI is the thing to do, but you have to consider, can you mobilize the cath lab rapidly? If you have prolonged delays with your infection control protocol, should you start antifibrinolytic ther anti therapy instead? So again, decision points. And they re-emphasize that a bedside echocardiogram in the emergency room at presentation or in, in the cardiology unit can identify uh, global myocardial dysfunction as a symbol or feature of non-occlusive coronary uh, or myocardial conditions. And it may be appropriate to defer emergency coronary angiography in those patients. So another, uh, this is from the American Heart Association. This is of course in from May, so it is obviously undergoing, this is their recommendation for an emergency management of patients. And again, in their pathway, they uh, recommend for uh, ST elevation MI pathway to really consider in the emergency room some bedside evaluation before making a decision to proceed. So here I will, uh, uh, you, you know, <laughs> open this to our panelists and ask them um, what is their viewpoint and experience with managing ST elevation MI in the ICUs. Thank you. Dr. Mason? Yeah, I can start. I have had three patients in the last three days who have presented with query MIs and two of them actually had myocarditis and one of them really did have an MI. And what we realized was this, that when you do the bedside echoes, the, it's, it's right. You, you sometimes see that there's a glob, globular hypokinesia. Uh, and you can also see some broken heart syndrome. We had a, one case a few weeks ago where the base was moving, but the apex was totally non-mobile. And this guy, you kept on thinking, hey, what's going on? And then you realized, hey, he's COVID. So we are seeing those patterns, but I really, what we are finding is that troponins are not useful. Neither are ECGs in discriminating who is ischemic and who isn't. Uh, and so we are ending up doing better bedside echoes just about on everybody where we think there's a cardiac issue. Uh, the ones where Which we have done NGOs haven't really found much. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry about that uh, noise, but. Which, which of these patients will you take for an emergency coronary revascularization to the cath lab? For us, anybody with a regional wall motion abnormality was taken to the cath lab. 
one of the ones this week were, who had a global abnormality because his presentation was an ST, uh, a, a VT, a VFRS, sorry. Uh, he was taken directly to the cath lab before coming to us and just showed nothing. Dr. Ves, you want to add something to? Yeah, I mean, luckily in our hospital, things are pretty much close to normal. So it's an indication taken to cath lab is pretty much same as it used to be before COVID. But otherwise, uh, talking about the COVID situation, <clears throat> uh, this study is very important, although a small study. Uh, so if you go by that, it means that if a patient has particularly inferior lateral ST segment elevation or ischemic changes, and the bedside echo shows that a patient has hypokinesia or low EF, definitely there are very high uh, likelihood that a patient has occlusive disease and uh, need to be taken to uh, for PCI. And otherwise, uh, again, this is a uh, very small but very important study, and some lesson can be learned from their experience. Uh, again, uh, when the COVID was at peak in March and April, uh, obviously, the situation was different, and that time the fibromyalgia therapy was more than normally we have seen. Uh, and again, these findings, bedside echo and uh, hypokinesia, and particularly low EF, that's an important uh, aspect to look into decide which patient goes to cath lab, but which patient need to be observed. But looking at that patient, <clears throat> which we spoke about uh, the case in Pakistan. Retrospectively, I mean, uh, I mean, I think at that time, the knowledge we had, I think they did the right thing. But again, now, I probably will take that patient to uh, cat lab if you know, facilities are available at that time. And, you know, that's an important point to discuss because when, when they did the repeat echo after their therapy, which was interestingly, they used therapeutic yeah. plasma exchange for that patient and it brought down the inflammatory markers. You know, one of the things we might discuss later on uh, but their echo before discharge was essentially normal. So, um, I mean, that's what I remember from, from the case discussion. So again, a very, uh, you know, at the, when the doctors were facing this decision at the bedside of ST elevation, chest pain and tachycardia, and, you know, the, there's a timer on of 60 to 120 minutes in which they can actually revascularize and save the myocardium. These are very tough decisions to make. Uh, so very important to uh, look at all, everything you can within that period of time. You know, uh, may I say something? Absolutely, of course. Okay, so uh, Mohsin had sent a very nice summary of the Intensive Care Society summary of experiences. And I'm just wondering, uh, because at the Cleveland Clinic, I think recently there was something reported where the number of uh, stress cardiomyopathies presenting in the ER have increased significantly, like as many as 8% compared to the pre-pandemic area. So it is just stress related. I think there was some time ago, there was a paper about what they call Trump cardiomyopathy, some lady with it was listening to to the speech and she developed chest pain and they did the, all the investigations and nothing came out. Uh, I don't know, most in, in the UK, if that was ever looked at or was there any, I mean, obviously when you have a patient with ST elevation and chest pain, you're probably going to take them to the cath lab, but just as an observation, have you seen a lot more stress-induced cardiomyopathy or the Taka uh, what's known as the broken heart syndrome cardiomyopathy? Or anybody else, sorry. Yeah. So I asked around after the, we started seeing this, and I think there was a discussion a couple of weeks ago or so, or a few days ago. Uh, and no, actually, the, there was four or five people from Pathworth. Uh, so they, they said at Pathworth they had seen some cases, uh, but that was about it. Nobody else came forth saying that, yes, we are seeing lots of those. Uh, I wonder whether this is related with what kind of virus or what mutation the virus has that you're being affected by, because there's some data emerging now saying that certain mutations are associated with certain complications. Uh, I suspect we will know a lot more as time progresses, but I wonder if that's what it is, because the phenotype, the patient phenotype seems to be changing as time is progressing. 
So <laughs> this is Jafar. Let me say, say, you know, one thing uh, that we all need to remember, yes, that was the COVID time or this is the COVID time and these patients are gonna come in and they will have ST elevations, they may have ST depression. We cannot uh, simply label because this is a COVID patient and ST elevation could be common and they may have there may be acute coronary syndrome going on. So depending on the patient's clinical presentation, your physical examination, and then having echo and other modalities available, even TE, which is, uh, can be done in the ICU settings and getting the right diagnosis and taking the patient to the cath lab because there is no contraindication for taking a patient to cath lab who is COVID positive except that if, we, if that intervention can happen and uh, can be done in a controlled setting, then it should be done. So this way, that patient who was going to benefit from it is not gonna be deprived of. And we know that during this time, a lot of patients died because of uh, either there was a wrong diagnosis done or, or the patient did not receive the care that they merit basically. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my screen again and then uh, Dr. Mohsen Zaman will drive the, the presentation. Um, I mean, I can, I, I will be forwarding the slides for him. And this but, uh, is going into, oh, sorry. Can I say something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I think the, uh, nothing to extra add, but uh, I think the take home point is the, the study you, which you shared uh, and the data from the American uh, Cardiology Society is uh, saying the same thing as we know from the very beginning. We should not be taking every patient, whether COVID or no COVID, to the cath lab immediately. And I think there was a pendulum swing uh, that every time there is some in, the next thing we see is the patient is taken to the cath lab, which is not should, should not be the standard of care. And I think the current uh, data in the presence of COVID is resetting our priorities from cardiology perspective. The ST elevation in, this, in the limited leads, uh, the wall motion abnormalities, those are the things which really benefit from uh, any kind of revascularization. Uh, the rest of the thing don't. So usual care that we're supposed to be doing right now should be doing later on. Absolutely right. So thank you very much. So uh, we'll move on to now real uh, or not a classic ICU. Um, let me see where I, okay. So Dr. Mohsen Zaman, if you, I can forward the slides for you as uh, you can explain what um, the ICS has described. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohsen Zaman. Apologies, I was mute for a bit. Uh, so what had happened uh, some time ago, the Intensive Care Society came up with two short documents, which was basically a synthesis of summary of whatever had been experienced in the UK nationally and what was seen internationally from the data which was available at that time. So we thought it would be ideal at this time to go through that and see what was the learning and how we can reflect on it. Next slide, please. So awake proning, uh, that was an interesting thing. In the past, there was not much robust data for patients to be pr proned awake. Uh, and it started to appear that, that we identified that at least in this cohort, awake proning seemed to help in terms of delaying their progression to invasive ventilation. As a matter of fact, uh, in our own hospital, we identified that those who got offered proning had a 30% lower likelihood when compared to similar patients of being intubated. Uh, so yes, we did find that awake proning was helpful, uh, especially so if the nurses were properly trained in doing it. But I would really welcome your comments as to what you found in your institutions. So uh, Mohsen, I have a question about awake proning and in patients, you know, you know that the, the population that we deal with, uh, with uh, large bellies and uh, with COPD, they're smoker for 35 years. And, yeah. 
and they can't, uh, they are so claustrophobic of uh, laying down. Most of them, they sleep with the head up, the bed up at 30 degrees. Yeah. And uh, what do you do in those situations? So we did two things. One, we had beds which can take the form of almost a chair. So these people were more or less seated and this they stayed seated, especially if the BMIs were 50 plus. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can actually not do that, then in others, we ended up doing reverse Trundleberg positions yeah. to so see if we could get the belly out of the way. Right. Uh, Sometimes we would put lots of pillows under one side with the hope that they will lean a bit to the other. Mm -hmm. So uh, not classical positioning, but it does seem to help that once you get the belly out of the way, the, it, it does improve their ventilation. So what we have done is uh, especially using wedge underneath the shoulders and using a reverse Trunnenberg position. And that has helped actually in those situations. Mm -hmm. Some of the patients, you know, there are patients who are claustrophobic and they will not let you to put them face down. Oh. But, uh, but in some, in other patients, it has helped with the wedge underneath the shoulders. Cool. I think that's what, yeah, that's what I have seen also. We also have, a, we are also beginning to monitor a lot of patients on the floor. I mean, I don't work for a particular hospital, but we have about a hundred ICUs that we monitor over with eight physicians on call. And many of us get assigned to, to the floor and the intermediate care unit with a, a specifically in almost known as proning wards, you know, where the patients are usually younger, not as sick, but they're, you know, the happy hypoxic young patients that are coming in. And early proning is being done a lot more than it used to be, is what I've seen. And we are actually part of their protocol team to, to help the nurses implement it. Uh, this is Kaleem. I, I have the same experience as Jaffer explaining. Our patient population uh, has difficulty tolerating awake proning uh, most of the time. We are using primarily uh, on the floor uh, heated high flow oxygen, which we can give up to 60 liters plus, uh, uh, and that. Uh, uh, now, the maximum I have seen patient to about uh, eight hours, uh, uh, four hour increment, but uh, continuous doing it for 12 to 16 hours, which we recommend uh, is challenging in my patient population. Uh, yeah, uh, the only thing I might want to add to this is that initially we identified that since we were following the intensive care society guideline and they said, check uh, or change position every two hours, the nurses were doing hourly obs on these patients and they would wake them to do the blood pressures. So I had to really go ahead and emphasize the fact that if the SATs are fine, heart rate is fine, respiratory rate is okay, do not put blood pressure cuffs on and start doing blood pressures, let them sleep. And unless numbers change, that's when you can go ahead and do the full set and then escalate care. Uh, next slide, please. So CPAP. So again, uh, one of my colleagues coined the term extreme CPAP, which, which I think was very apt for what we were seeing, that patients who we would initially have offered invasive ventilation in the old days got offered CPAP sooner, but we persevered with CPAP a lot longer, especially in our patient cohorts where the BMIs were above 50, and where we thought that we won't be able to prone them once we have intubated them, and we won't be able to offer a lot of the, or at least we didn't think that we could safely invasively ventilate them. Uh, and we did find that if you persevere with the CPAP, it, it, it actually, we, it appears at least to us, the numbers are small, that you might get away from with just CPAP and not invasively ventilating them. Uh, but what we did find was that the average duration of CPAP in the setting where they were brought to ITU and where we were thinking, okay, anything goes wrong, we are going to intubate this person. Uh, on average, they lasted around seven days on CPAP and then they got better or they passed away or got intubated. But what would you, what, what has your experience been? 
So um, we are not using CPAP because majority of our rooms are not uh, radio pressure uh, on the floor. And uh, we are utilizing primarily heated high flow oxygen. And if patient is uh, not able to tolerate that and still has very hypoxic, uh, then we um, do the intubation uh, rather than going into the non-invasive. Uh, if we have negative pressure room, then we are doing it, but only we have in the uh, ICU setting and we have limited numbers. I have a question about the whole concept of using, you know, initially from the Italian experience in Lombardy, the emphasis was, or at least became in the UK, early securing the airway early and sealing off with an endotracheal tube. Yeah. And primarily CPAP was considered only a temporizing measure. One of the major concerns were that it aerosolizes the virus to all the healthcare providers, the nurses and the doctors. And um, you know that adds to the burden. So that seems to have really kind of turned around in the last three or three months, I would say. What, what, you, what would be your comments on that about the risk of transmission with CPAP? Well, um, the thing is that in the Europe and Italy, they have the, what you call helmet. Uh, and uh, that helmet uh, we don't have available here in, in our center. And uh, I asked uh, some other centers close by, we don't carry those kind of CPAP helmets. So having the CPAP helmet uh, has some uh, definitely protection, but using this regular CPAP mask uh, as a sleep specialist, we, I have a tremendous experience using uh, this device and a lot of success, but uh, the infection control issue uh, is not going to be mitigated unless you have either the negative pressure room or some kind of other devices which the European has. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what, what the Zaman, uh, uh, Dr. Zaman has to say. Oh, so uh, what we did was we actually found that uh, hoods were only, so we didn't have hoods for everybody. We offered hoods to those where we found that they can't tolerate the masks. Everybody who got into, got offered CPAP, was in a negative pressure room or in a side room with a nurse who was told always in adequate PPE at all times. Um, what we did find, some, some, some things were concerning though. We found that sometimes these patients got stressed and they would start pulling at their tubing. So the rate of delirium was higher than anticipated. And, mm -hmm. and so we ended up making sure that the nursing ratios were higher than what we had initially been doing. So that was one thing we identified. As for infections, okay, looking at our sickness rates, they are no different to areas where CPAP was offered to areas where unselected take was there. So this perception that people might be more at risk if they're in that area, at least didn't translate in practice when we saw these. Uh, what else? So that's about the gist of it. You know, there are viral filters, which are, you know, that we have uh, placed on every single anesthesia machines uh, in the operating room, as well as, you know, when we were using our uh, anesthesia machines to uh, mechanically ventilate uh, all these uh, uh, COVID patients in our PACU with the negative pressure. So there are possibilities that you can use a CPAP with a expiratory uh, antiviral uh, filter on them, and to reduce the amount of burden of uh, of the of the virus into the environment, as well. But again, uh, you know, a lot of patients they will not tolerate CPAP mask for 12 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. So this may be a bridge, but a continuous CPAP for hours and hours is again a, an issue. Uh, I think that the problem is that the selecting of the mask, so the, the routine CPAP BiPAP machine which we use, they don't have, they have a mask which has an exhalation port at the mask. So the ventilation breathe, the, the exhalation goes out from the mask itself. So it doesn't go through the circuit like in the ventilator and you have, mm -hmm. uh, like, or when you do the mask ventilation, uh, it is, uh, the filters is going to take care of that thing because it's going to be closed circuits unless the mask is broken. 
but for the regular ResMed uh, Respironic uh, devices, which we are using, uh, that's a mask, it's a very different mask. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, you know, that you need to understand it well, that uh, what type of device is being utilized. And, uh, you know, there are devices where you can put expiratory valve with a, uh, with a viral filter on them. Yes, I think Philips makes one, and that is actually being used in some of the hospitals in Pakistan that I've become aware of. Uh, uh, we're actually looking at providing BiPAP to Pakistan, so this is a very interesting discussion for us, for me uh, to listen to. Uh, what I have seen is uh, that most of the time, ideally, we want negative pressure rooms and then PPE. Some people are even putting a mask, uh, 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 N95 mask on top of the mask to prevent to, uh, when there is a leak to prevent too much transmission. I was looking up some data on up to date and as far as I can recall, I'll try and find that reference that what they were, they're basically saying is right now we don't have good data one way or the other, whether the risk of transmission is higher than otherwise in a negative pressure room with uh, provided you are of course taking all the precautions of PPEs and you know being diligent about your uh, hand washing, et cetera. And, following all the other protocols. So that's an interesting um, scenario where we don't want to intubate people. BiPAP is a good modality to use, but then we are concerned about transmission as well as wearing. One point about the, um, the, the tolerance of, uh, of CPAP, uh, I think one of the things that we, are, we have instituted in almost all the ICUs and we are trying to is to let the patient sleep adequately using melatonin routinely on these patients. And uh, I think we use about six milligrams, three to six milligrams of melatonin and it, hopefully it is helping. I don't think I have data to tell you one way or the other, but we are trying that. So one of the things that uh, uh, at least in the in the pedi in pediatric population where CPAP or BiPAP is needed, uh, some of the kids will not tolerate that tight fitting um, kind of facial mask, but they will tolerate uh, what's called a scuba steve mask, and it's essentially uh, similar to a scuba mask, scuba diving mask, which is covers the entire face and seals off the entire face and has an expiratory port. And it fits very well, seals it well, but doesn't have the, the severe, um, so kids, and I'm not sure if that is used in adults. I know that there are some institutions when we are running out of PPE, use that as a means of uh, healthcare personnel protecting themselves from contamination. But any, anyone has an experience with that uh, scuba mask for CPAP, um, yes, we, we have used that thing, uh, not during this uh, pandemic, uh, but uh, I used to call it a moon uh, face mask, all the way, going all the way down. Uh, and it's very comfortable uh, in even the very obese patient, uh, but uh, we have not used this during the COVID scenario. The other thing which I have seen uh, uh, is uh, not in the COVID in area, but before that, that anytime somebody is on constant uh, uh, non-invasive thing, uh, 48 hours is the max I have seen. After that, there's a lot of issue with the, the pressure ulceration the, and the pressure sores on the mouth and it's horrible, horrible kind of face. Uh, nurses usually yell at us when, when they see this kind of thing. We are not doing anything up for that. Iqbal, there is a, there is a question in the, in, in the QA session that does early intubation lead to higher mortality? Let's take that question. Please ah, <laughs> now <laughs> this can be a bit contentious yeah. because at least in our unit we came to believe that that uh, might be the case. And so we did delay intubation quite a bit, especially if there were, so let us take it this way. What we did was we said that if the patient had characteristics which made it difficult to invasively ventilate them, then we thought that possibly delaying that process might be better on the ground that there was not much evidence that invasively, invasively ventilating them would improve their chances of survival. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I, 
I look at it uh, in a in a different way. You know, when I look at these patients and I know that the patient is breathing 35 times a minute and pulse ox saturation remains uh, with a, we use a lot more high flow nasal cannula between 30 to 40 liters. And, uh, and if the patients are uh, not improving on that with 40% oxygen, maybe 50% oxygen, and they are still huffing and puffing and lactate is slowly rising and the blood pressure start dropping, then that's the time to get them intubated before it gets too late. So, Mr. Um, West, I think it also depends on uh, the outcome uh, post intubation patient, depends on uh, your uh, where the patient is. I think in Pakistan, if uh, I, from my experience and talking with people, that uh, after intubation, the survival is low in Pakistan. There are many reasons for that. I think the the monitoring of the patient on ventilator is not as good as in uh, other countries like UK or USA because of the availability of staff. Uh, I think that's the one thing. Uh, that's why I think they tend to, or actually they should delay a little bit as far as they could uh, to patient on intubation. Or the other reason could be that they wait a bit too long uh, when patient is really very sick and they get intubated at that time. But definitely there is uh, uh, something to look at into why the outcome of the intubated patient is uh, worse in Pakistan as compared to the developed countries. Um, one more thing, I think uh, uh, I think we'll learn a lot from uh, after we review the data. I don't think it's only in Pakistan. If you see the data coming early from uh, the, from the Italy and also if from the New York, uh, from Mount Sinai, from Elmhurst, you know, Elmhurst was a graveyard. And the reason was that, that they were so overwhelmed that the usual care which we usually provide hardly was compromised. The second thing is that in journal, when we intubate the patient, the care of the tube, the care bundles which we implement, we try to force it you know, so strongly that everybody should get all the care bundles. Now in a COVID situation, when you have to take about 15 minutes, 20 minutes for the nursing and everybody's concerned about that thing, I don't know how many times they were doing real uh, tube care. And the data which you are see from our anesthesiology people who are dedicated for tube changing and uh, intubation, they, the anecdotal stories is that they have seen clogged tube uh, you know, in third, fourth, fifth day that they never seen it before. So is it because of the disease process of the COVID, which is different than anything else, or it's because of the usual care was not provided on a regular basis. I think this jury is still out. It is. So the Society of Critical Care Medicine actually have published a, a very nice uh, kind of a white paper, I will say, where they talk about configuring the ICU in a COVID-19 era. And uh, they talk about all these issues. And I will see if I can share that uh, document with everyone. And, That'll be wonderful. And, uh, you know, so it does talk about everything from really in relation to increasing the capacity of ICU, even infusion pumps. You know, we used to have infusion pumps in the uh, inpatient room. Now, all these COVID ICU patients have infusion pumps outside the room. Even our ECMO patients have infusion pumps sitting outside the ICU room. Uh, with, the, with the monitoring devices, you know, how we are monitoring these patients, what kind of respiratory care we are providing to these patients. Are they getting respiratory care? Are they getting the bronchodilators that they were supposed to get? You know, especially these COPD patients, asthma patients, they do require their medications. And if we take away those medications from them, sure, they're gonna get complications. Environment, room environment, negative pressure, positive pressure, all those. And then communications with the patients if they are awake or their families, you know. So there are so many things uh, which we learned during this time period. And I'm gonna see if I can uh, share that document so that we can share, share with, with everybody. Okay, I will send it to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaffer, for uh, re-emphasizing and all of all of the panelists re-emphasizing the attention to detail and the escalation of care on invasively ventilated patients and how uh, if we can't provide that, then of course it increases the risk of even 
COVID or no COVID, it increases the risk of being on a positive pressure ventilator. Yeah. So again, very challenging. I, I really like the idea that you shared about having infusion pumps outside, which do not expose the nursing staff every time they have to change the infusion to adjust. Even, uh, even the, in addition to that, one of the hospitals that I'm monitoring, they have the, this outside, the ventilator is outside. They've gotten extended tubings for everything. Also, continuous glucose monitoring is being done instead of going in every hour for an IQ check. So. so all great points. We have a couple of very relevant questions. If I can pose them to the panel, Dr. Jaska, you asked, what is the lowest PaO2 that can be tolerated before you decide to it? So I, I usually target up to between 55 to 57. And uh, I don't let it go below that. On, on about 60% of IO2 is what I usually do. 60% of IO2 with a PO2 of 60 or 55 to 60. So you're talking about a saturation in the, essentially in the 80s or to yeah, mid 80s. About 85% saturation. <laughs> okay. So, so for the COVID thing, I think uh, uh, I would go for PO2 of 60 with all the uh, non-invasive maneuvering, whatever you're doing. Uh, if you are doing uh, uh, CPAP, BiPAP, uh, heated high flow, high flow, if it is not beyond that, because the uh, saturation you could retain around uh, 85 uh, to 90% on PO2 of 6% easily. Uh, and a patient is not uh, tachypneic, it's not only the saturation. If the saturation is uh, low and patient is not huffing and puffing, you still have time. But if somebody's saturation is 92, but the patient is breathing 35 per time, that's time to intubate. I agree. Yeah. Good to reemphasize that it's not only one number that you should look at, but uh, right. so basically consensus is saturation in the sort of 80, mid 80s and PO2 around 60 is yeah. tolerable. Uh, so the next question to follow uh, that. But is, Iqbal, I want to emphasize that the, the data, the, all the society guidelines, which is coming in the COVID thing, they wanted to maintain the saturation above 92%. Some, some, some of them even saying to maintain around 94. And that's the reason awake proning is uh, so much emphasized with that. So I don't know whether I would uh, uh, back this thing from any solid data that uh, maintaining somebody's saturation in mid 80s is going to be okay. I, I think I'll be very careful with this. There, there, was a, there was a small study which came out of uh, somewhere in Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago, where they identified that if you tolerated uh, SATs below 90%, uh, the risk of mortality was much, much higher. But mm -hmm. the, the total cohort was around 25 patients. So not enough to change practice, but enough to just have those alarm bells going off that are we really doing the right thing? So, you know, there is one thing that, uh, again, it's not one number. So mm -hmm. we do need to look at the whole clinical picture. And uh, again, if a person is breathing for 30, uh, 35 times a minute and the lactate is full and the blood pressure is dropping and the urine is dropping, then we can make sure that we intervene timely. Okay, thank you very much for that. The, the follow-up question from Dr. Yasin is, how long have you seen CPAP or BiPAP being tolerated till weaning without need for switching to intubation in COVID patients? So what is the longest period that you have managed to tide patients over without intubation on these non-invasive support measures? 14 days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and, and then they didn't need to be invisibly ventilated, but they end up on CPAP for 14 days. You would look at them every day, go, what's going on here? So, Zaman, let, let, me, let me ask you, how you are, uh, is it a continuous 14 day? Uh, and what was the uh, challenges and how you guys dealt with the uh, feeding those patients uh, and, uh, you know, pressure ulceration issues, how, how you guys did that? So the way it went was this, that anybody who was being offered CPAP, we offered them an NG intubation at the time CPAP was being initiated. 
And that was done after the first three, four weeks when we realized that sometimes they desaturate so massively without the CPAP on that it was not really safe to go ahead and play at that point. Uh, as far as uh, pressure ulcers goes, uh, what we realized was it depended on what kit we used. When we were using the Mercedes kit, uh, the ulcers were actually behind the ears, not on the face, which was a bit of a surprise that that's where they was finding that the straps were causing issues. Uh, other than that, there is this little thing they find, which is a bit of a cushion, which sits all the way around where the mask is going to sit. And, and we started using those more frequently than we would have otherwise. And that seemed to have helped quite a bit. The other thing was that uh, we made sure that when patients were getting their time off the CPAP mask, which was around 15 minutes every two or three hours or so, we would make sure that there were nasal high flow and they really did get some time off rather than constantly being on it. But I, I certainly do agree with the point that we had a lot more pressure injury than we would otherwise have accepted. And the other thing we did was that if there was that, we would offer them a hood. If the nose cannot tolerate or face cannot tolerate, then we would offer them different masks to see whatever would suit them best. So I think it would be very helpful to have all of these kind of pointers in a, in, in a document or a page of how to deliver CPAP with minimizing all these issues and you know prolonging the possibility if indicated of uh, avoiding intubation. If Mohsen, I think you've mentioned to me two devices that we've discussed before, the Falmodyne and the Mercedes that we don't really, I haven't seen it being used. I don't know if any of my colleagues have, you know? So it may also be your devices are a little different than ours that are- It, it, it certainly could be, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Mercedes device here is the Ford. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, oh. Shall we move on to another topic? Uh, yes. As, uh, you know, time is moving along. So, more Dr. Mohsen? Yes. So, mechanical ventilation. This was an interesting thing. It, the data initially came coming out of Italy was very much like there are two different phenotypes. Uh, and the fact that not everybody would respond to the high PEEP as, as per ARDS net guidelines. Uh, to be fair to them, we found the two phenotypes and everything in between. What we realized was it was very individualistic that some patients would have decent compliance, but you would look at their lungs, the imaging, look at their ultrasounds and go, nah, this, this needs more support than what it looks like. People did not behave as sick as their imaging would suggest they were. Uh, and so we did find that when you gave them higher peeps, uh, you were struggling to manage their volumes, so as to speak. Uh, because I think we were ending up at the wrong end of the compliance curve with the higher peep. Uh, having said that, uh, we did move on to APRV quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that might bias my view of things because if CPAP has not, I mean, if BiPAP hasn't worked within two hours, my patients would be on APRV. And that used to be the practice for at least half, half my unit. My other half of my unit doesn't like APRV, so they would paralyze them and prone them quickly. Yeah, but, I agree with Mohsen. You know, I like, I really like APRV, area pressure release ventilation. And uh, it has worked uh, a lot, actually, for not only COVID patients, but as non-COVID patient as well. But uh, most of these patients, uh, again, it depends on how good you feel like that the mode of ventilation that you're using is going to be uh, also the people around uh, that patient know that mode of ventilation well. Yeah. So if I am the only one who knows that mode of ventilation, and uh, everybody else is trying to realize, oh, I have no idea. And the respiratory therapist and the, the bedside nurses have no idea, then that patient is not going to do well. Yeah. So you want to make sure everybody understand. Either it's an SIMV with, uh, with pressure support or, or assist control mode or uh, APRV or PRVC, whichever mode you're going to be using. Yeah. And you need to make sure that everybody understand how to use that mode of ventilation for these patients. 
Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, I think uh, you, you, did, you hit the nail. Uh, that is the key. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we need to have uh, some published data because uh, uh, I remember 20 years ago, my mentor used to say, we have a lot of fancy mode of ventilation still waiting for the indication. And uh, <laughs> so I think uh, uh, unless, uh, you know, the last thing which we have seen in the N1H1 pandemic is the proning coming up strongly in terms of looking at the survival benefit. And unless we have some survival benefit, especially when we are focusing our discussion in terms of uh, those people who is going to be dealing with, uh, who has a limited supply of the ventilator and mode, uh, I think uh, if we get some data from your experience uh, showing there's a mortality benefit uh, or let the step benefit, then probably we need to train more people in terms of you know how to deal with that. Okay, I agree. So, uh, Dr. Jaffer, what in your mind, briefly, is the benefit in these patients of APRV versus other ventilating modes like pressure control or? Uh, so, especially ICRV, APRV, you can use, you have two levels of peeps basically in these patients, and you are using higher level of peeps without paralyzing the patient. And uh, it's, uh, it's not, basically, it's an inverse ratio ventilation. But in a better way, that you are recruit, your recruitment is much better of, uh, and uh, homogeneous distribution of, uh, of uh, gas exchange is much improved in these patients. So that's why I like APRV. So not every single patient is going to respond to APRV. Depends on your patient and their physiologic uh, response. And if, uh, if you feel like that you are comfortable using assist control, or synchronize intermittent mandatory ventilation with pressure support with a PEEP of eight or 10 or 12, depending on what the optimum PEEP level is. And a lot of time also now people are using a lot more driving pressure. When you look at you know adding more PEEP is not compromising your driving pressure, then you know that uh, that patient is gonna do well. But if the patients, as you keep on adding PEEP, and your PK pressures are keep on rising and your driving pressure is rising, then you're not going to be able to ventilate that type of patient with a high PEEP. So, so does, the, does, the, does your assessment of whether the phenotype of the patient with COVID-19 pneumonia is the ARDS classical phenotype or the relatively higher compliance phenotype, does that make a difference in what more you choose? This is questions for both Mohsin and Jaffer. Okay. Mohsin, you want to take it? Uh, <laughs> uh, I was answering. Uh, okay, fine. Can you rephrase your, can you ask your question one more time, please? So it's basically he's asking about the, the two phenotypes, you know, the, oh. the, the, <laughs> the, so, the Italian phenotypes. Yes, the Italian phenotypes. To be fair, we started off, uh, the data was out and we were very convinced, oh, this is what we are going to see and we will decide how we are going to go ahead and treat them differently. And actually the experience is, no, it's very individualistic. You can't divide them into two phenotypes and think you have got it right. It very much had to be, look at the patient, examine your patient, play with the vent a bit, figure out what the patient's lungs are doing, and keep in mind that as the disease progresses, this will change. You know, as that uh, study came out, what we started doing was we started looking at lung compliance on a, every four hour basis on these patients, ah. adjusting accordingly. Mm -hmm. And we, we were to our surprise, we found not only a day-to-day -day variation, we even found like a 12 hour variation. So I mean, uh, labeling phenotypes is probably not accurate, but labeling phenotype at a particular time might be accurate. Right. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you something? Uh, do you think uh, in your experience, uh, uh, figuring out which phenotype, do you think that this is a dynamic process starting from the L going to the H and is a basically a transition rather than yeah. any specific patient population? You know, if you have a more fluid, more uh, edema in the lung and lung is getting electrolytic and stiff, you're going to have a phenotype. 
And if you don't have that thing, just uh, initial uh, issues, then your lung is going to be compliant. So it's a major, this is my understanding, but I don't know how you guys had no, taken I, out. I think you've hit the nail on the head. And that's exactly what I was just saying, Kaleem, that it, that's why we started measuring compliances every four hours to look at, at a particular time, what mm -hmm. that patient's phenotype is at that point. You know? so, okay. what, what about you, Dr. Jaffa? What do you think? So I agree with you. You know, there are multiple things that are, they matter, especially when these patients are in the ICU, you are giving fluids to these patients. Their cardiac status is going to change from an EF of 70% to 50%, maybe to 40%. Their renal function is going to change. They are making 100 ml per hour of urine and they change to 30 ml per hour of urine. Yeah. So everything is going to add up. And then on top of it, they have so many of uh, these inflammatory markers which are released. And then they have leaky capillary syndrome. So phenotypes will change with time. And uh, so we can't, I can't just get stuck with one phenotype. I have to make sure that every four hours, eight hours, 10 hours, we are assessing and reassessing these patients, making sure that everything what we are doing is, is as, uh, as a kind of a group instead of one thing at a time. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaffer and everybody. Dr. Mohsin, would you like to proceed with the rest of uh the elements on this slide. Well, yeah, uh, so to be fair, they're talking about mucus plugging, which was a big problem in the first few weeks with at least for our unit. We found that everything was clogging off. Uh, we realized that the circuits need to be a lot more wet than we are accustomed to. We realized that we had to change the filters a lot more frequently than we used to. And, and, and that seems to have managed that problem a bit. In the early days, I ended up doing a lot more Bronx than I do nowadays. And usually you could see literally casts forming in the airways and go, what the hell is going on here? Uh, but as time has progressed, I'm not seeing that much anymore. As a matter of fact, uh, I've had to do a few bronchs today. Uh, nothing much coming about from thick secretions, but that was about it. So things have changed, but I do agree that, or at least that's what was our experience in the beginning, that there was a lot of mucus plugging and blockage of airways. Similarly, for when they talk about extubation, we had quite a few failed extubations in the early course of disease, where people would look so well that they we would normally as they would meet the criteria for extubation, you would extubate them, and two days later somebody will tell you, yeah, the extubation failed, they're back intubated. Uh, so with that, uh, there is some new data coming out about uh, inhaled heparin and and acetylcysteine. Ah. Best for uh, for patients uh, with these with the COVID pneumonia or thick secretions, because we used to you know we have used it very successfully in burn patients who have inhalation of burn injuries and they come in and mucomist and with other bronchodilators or sometimes uh, heparin with bicarb they have loosened the secretions but now people have started using uh, inhalational heparin with uh, with an acetone sustain or mucomist uh, to every four to six hours between 10,000 units of uh, in uh, 10,000 uh, units of uh, heparin and uh, nebulized into the airway what do you guys think about that have you heard of it not yet but it's an intriguing thought I've seen it as a as a modality, I haven't used it yet. Same here. I have, I have used uh, the anestal cysteine uh, quite a bit in the past, uh, not in the recent COVID thing. Um, and it worked, uh, especially during bronch when we see a lot of uh, thick secretions uh, and mucus plugging. But the heparin uh, have not, never used that thing and probably have to look into it. So heparin has two effects. Number one, it's anticoagulant effect. And number two, it's an uh, anti-inflammatory effect. effect, right? Yeah. So, so both ways. Uh, so, I think the data should be coming out soon, and they, there is there are few case reports, and hopefully, people are going to do some studies on this as well. And uh, I just wanted to hear from you guys. I haven't used it, but I have heard about it. Cool. So, yeah. Uh, 
Any other questions or do we move on to the next page? Uh, so what about spontaneous breathing trials? You, there's a lot of failed extubations initially. What yeah. have to be done to minimize that rate of failed extubation? So again, uh, you know, I think I can take that. Uh, the, the question is why patients fail extubation? So a lot of fear was in the, in the beginning. Most of these patients after extubation got stuck in the room and no respiratory therapy, no, everybody is worried about aerosolization of the virus particle and no incentives parametry, no deep breathing exercises, anything. So we need to continue everything after we extubate these patients so they can actually stay extubated. And either you extubate them on a BiPAP or you extubate them on a high flow nasal cannula, but they need to continue to have those uh, uh, physical therapy, incentives, spirometry, bronchodilators, whatever you know, we can do to, uh, to loosen their secretions, get those secretions out of the airway and keep them extubated. Um, can, can I ask you a question, you guys? Uh, the, looking at the pathophysiology of COVID, does anybody has looked into the infinity marker and the serial monitoring of those markers in patients uh, who are extubated and see whether that has any correlation with the failed extubation? Meaning, if somebody has already have high infinity markers and uh, you got TOSI and then your lungs got a little better, uh, and the uh, oxygenation improve and usual number is fine, but your markers has not gone down. Mm -hmm. Does it, does anybody has looking into this that that might have played a role that, that the cytokine storm is not completely out of the board and the patient is against, um, uh, against that kind of process which require further worsening of the respiratory status and intubation? Anybody? I think it makes sense, but I don't know if I have, we have any um, uh, systematic data on it. In this no, I've not seen any data. Uh, the limited experience I have is that if the inflammatory markers were up and you extubated, you got in trouble. The only thing I added to my care or changed in my care was the fact that I started using lung ultrasound a lot more. And if the lungs look like lots and lots of B lines, mm -hmm. even if the FiO2 was low and I was thinking, hey, work of breathing is getting better, I would shy away from just extubating them right away, give them a bit longer and see where those uh, lung findings went. But I did find that if there were no B lines in the apices of the middle of the lung, uh, then they tended to do better in terms of being extubated and remain extubated. One, one point that we have added after looking at about three patients in one week that got reintubated because of upper airway obstruction, laryngeal edema. Oh. And uh, and that and therefore we started using steroids in these patients. And I think the day after I saw my first patient, something came out. Either it was in the New England Journal, or in the um, you know the fast, the MGH uh, uh, weekly thing, the daily thing that used to come out about laryngeal extubation, about laryngeal edema in these patients. That is a lot more. And we started using dexamethasone not for the COVID but for the uh, laryngeal. Uh, so that that's all I could add to that. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Mohsen, the next yes. topic. The next one. So, fluid in kidneys. Now, this is interesting. Almost 50% of the time when our CPAP unit, or at least the ward where we were running CPAP, would refer patients to us for saying that this patient probably needs escalation of care, diuretics tend to, tend to reduce their likely tended to make the patients improve. So much so that almost half the patients who got diuretics did not get escalated. Uh, and that was one thing which was interesting given a lot of people were saying that the work of breathing is so much, they're so tachypneic, they're losing so much air, uh, so much water, that insensible losses are high. But the experience, at least mine, was that if you kept them a bit on the drier side, they did better. I do agree with the fact that when they did end up on renal replacement therapy, they stayed on it much, much longer. And those who had renal replacement were on the unit a lot longer than they, you would otherwise have anticipated them to be. But I would, I would welcome any comments from you guys. Dr. Vass, this is your baby. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, unmute. Okay. Yes, uh, actually, we learned uh, a lot of things uh, during this uh, COVID three, two, three months. Uh, one of those uh, things that this definitely is a def different disease than a typical ARDS. Uh, this is a different uh, disease. Prior to that, being an intensivist and nephrologist, uh, um, typically nephrologists like to give more fluid and the pulmonologists like to have less fluid in patients who has uh, intubated or in ICU. But I am always tend to keep the patient on the dry side. Okay, I knew that if patient goes through a little bit of pre-renal, uh, not better. I mean, we can give fluid later and patient would uh, come out of pre-renal, but uh, extubation patient and respiratory status improvement is more important. Uh, so we initially applied the same principle to patient on COVID and we try to keep the patient dead up on the dry side, but we learned that uh, this is not the right approach and patients were going to renal failure more quickly and that has its own uh, complication. One drawback was that when they have low GFR, uh, they cannot be given remdesivir, okay? And that actually changed uh, in my opinion and many people's opinion that do make, uh, make some difference. So the baseline is that patients need to be keep, kept uh, u volumic. Uh, do not try to make them on the dry side, obviously on the wet side also. Other thing we noticed that these patients are very inflammatory or their inflammatory response is very high. They have more insensible loss than typical uh, ICU patient on ventilation. They tend to get hypernatremic very quickly also. And that also signs that patient has uh, um, obviously volume depleted. So bottom line is that keep the patient U volumic, don't try to uh, make them uh, hypovolemic uh, and a little bit less use of diuretics as compared to other patient, non-COVID patient who are on uh, respiratory failure. I agree with the West. Uh, I like to keep them U volumic. Actually, if you look at uh, most of the patients in ICU, they tend to be hypervolemic as compared to hypovolemic in the sense of, uh, because this is a kind of a, one of the complications of being in ICU. And uh, if we can uh, manage fluids well in these patients and looking at not only fluids, that what kind of fluids we are giving to them and also keeping an eye on their perfusion status, that being urine output, also lactate level, their mental status, and, uh, and sometimes even other uh, uh, you know, dynamic parameters like stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation. If we look at those, all those things together, then we should be able to manage these patients. But I like uh, the idea of uh, having them uvolemic as compared to dry. Um, Mohsen, you... this is Kaleem. Um, yes. So your, what you are uh, uh, saying here is kind of a little different than this, our American folks. Uh, yes, so, but, but so no, let, think, let me uh, qualify what I said. Yeah, but there's a little silver lining, I think, yes. here. Uh, I think looking at the Society of Critical Care data on the food management point of view, uh, in a conservative versus liberal, uh, I think a review of that uh, tells us that the conservative uh, was positive fruit balance uh, around two liters, and the liberal was about eight to 10 liters. So as Jaffer was mentioning, you know, this somebody who is already in ICU is a risk factor for fluid overload because we got so many different things. Mm. So is your data shows any uh, I, uh, intake and output balance, how much the balance you are guys keeping in? Because I think that's give you the uh, yes. idea rather than laces, because even in the conservative data in the Society of Critical Care and Survival Sepsis, they were giving LASIX to mm. those patients if yes. they see that there is a high volume there. So no, this was slightly different. So let me qualify some of the things that, that need to be mentioned here then. Uh, first of all, uh, these patients were, that I'm talking about were more in an HDU kind of a setting rather than ITU. Uh, two, what we found was that when you scan their lungs, uh, you would still see B lines all over the place. And that, so the two things I used to look at before I would say diuretic because most of these people were not on diuretics to begin with, 
and on, on looking in their volume status, they would be positive three, four liters. Yes. But the consultants who are looking after them or the physicians looking after them would say, uh, but we think all of this is insensible loss, so we are not counting this as a positive balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I've uh, tended to note was that if you've got B lines and you've got reversal of hepatic flow, those were my two indicators to say, I think you need diuretics rather than anything else. Makes sense. Uh, so, but I did find that clinically, it was very difficult for people to just examine and come to a conclusion what the volume status was. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, uh, whatever tools you have, if you are convinced that patient is volume overloaded, definitely that patient needs yeah. to be, I mean, tried out. I mean, a little bit. I mean, needs diuretics. The diuretics by itself are not like nephrotoxic. It all depends on that you give too less or too much. I mean, that's makes the difference. And to be fair, we just made sure that these were stat doses rather than constant IV diuresis. And again, I did advise that do not give IV fluids willy nilly, just keep an eye so, on things. Uh, so that I think uh, I think again in the context that we are talking about to for our Pakistani colleague, there are a lot of patients in Pakistan is being treated at home because they're afraid of going to the hospital, and that there are some good physicians who are develop some practice guideline, and they are incorporating diuretic into the treatment regimen, even on those patients who are staying in the hospital. I know personally a patient of uh, a friend of mine was hardly drinking anything and uh, very much decreased uh, you know, PO intake. And then uh, just on the basis of the chest X-ray uh, before it go, went to the hospital, the consultant asked the patient to take diuretic. Uh, and that is, I think, the key point. Volume assessment is the most important issue rather than any specific medication. No, I agree. As a matter of fact, there was a little study out some years ago which identified that uh, there was this practice that COPD patients who come short of breath, people were giving them nebulizers and diuretics along with treatment for exacerbation. So those who got diuretics were more likely to die than those who did not get diuretics. So this blindly giving people diuretics is, is, is a bad idea. I totally agree with that. So I'd lead uh, leads to the next question. Let's say that we, we have these patients now in established uh, renal failure, Dr. Avas Masood, what is your preferred mode of uh, renal replacement therapy for patients? What have you found in your experience and from the guidelines that is, is kind of helps people guide their uh, approach to renal replacement therapy? I mean, <sighs> Basically, the other important thing is that these patients are, uh, who are in ICU, when they develop a renal failure, obviously that add to their complexity and they are already very unstable. So these patients, uh, the mode of uh, renal replacement therapy is important. Uh, it all depends on what availability you have. Uh, obviously, if you have availability of uh, CVVH, uh, pretty much every patient gets CVVH a modality in the USA, I'm sure in UK also, but Pakistan, where the availability is very rare, main thing is that to do the very gentle dialysis. Make sure that keep an eye on their uh, blood pressure and also keep an eye on that, how much uh, fluid you uh, taking off. If you don't have CVVH, you would just do very gentle dialysis in ICU. Uh, gentle mean that the filter use should be small one. Uh, blood flow does not matter. Uh, but also the ultra filtration rate, the, how much fluid you're taking off should be very gentle. And it could be a prolonged uh, dialysis uh, session rather than typical three to four hours, sometimes even longer, six hours, seven hours. We call it SLED, um, uh, slow uh, dialysis. So that is the thing to go. Whatever uh, facility you have, make sure that you keep an eye on patient uh, blood pressure, hemodynamic stability, and gentle dialysis in ICU. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from the uh, attendees. And uh, one of them is in the fluid management strategy, is there any role for albumin? This is from Dr. Amir Suleiman. Any Short answer is no. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you this, uh, the, the albumin is a very, I think, the most uh, overused medication uh, in ICU. And there are very few indications. And I think the only genuine indication of albumin is when patient has a cirrhosis 
or uh, that renal uh, syndrome on patient or liver failure. Other than that, there are very few indications for giving LP1. Uh, another question, I think this has been answered about fiber optic bronchoscopy despite aggressive physical therapy. And Dr. Mosin, who's been called away, answered this uh, as there's less and less need with other um, uh, respiratory care measures. So I think he may have been called away to the question okay. call. So we will move on to some uh, other issues. So let me uh, talk about uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy. Okay. Yes, please. It's only indicated uh, when, when you see there are any mucus plugging or there are areas of the lungs which can be opened by doing a fiber optic bronchoscopy. Otherwise, uh, putting a, a scope is uh, uh, not sterile. It's a kind of a, not a dirty procedure, but it's not a, clean, uh, not a very sterile procedure. So there can be a secondary infections in the place that you always avoid unless it is really necessary. Totally agree. Uh, diagnostic, uh, if it's in need for diagnostic purposes to figure out infection, yes. If it is a major uh, segment uh, atelectasis, uh, and if your uh, non-invasive procedure, chest PT, uh, uh, and the percussion and pap therapy, if it is not helping, then you proceed otherwise, just for a small uh, atelectasis and some pneumonia to just suck it up, like our surgeon used to say, go there and suck it out, the pneumonia doesn't happen. You don't need to, especially in a COVID environment, you have to be very careful. Well, this is an interesting slide that Dr. Mohsen shared. Unfortunately, he's not, he's been called away for uh, ICU call. Oh, and, look at there's a nebulized heparin there. Yes, so I, I noticed that there's nebulized heparin, as you mentioned, uh, you know, yeah. thank you for, but there's all these investigators. But there's a streptokinase as well. There's yeah. streptokinase, there's citrulline. So all of these, obviously there's, this is, these are all under investigation. Maybe perhaps dexamethasone is, is something that is getting a little more established in, okay. in this. So, you know, that's a huge topic for discussion. Um, again, this is uh, another very important factor of how comorbid conditions impact the outcome of COVID-19 infection in patients. Uh, uh, Val, can I ask you one thing? Have we discussed uh, about steroids? I think uh, that many people have questioned regarding uh, steroids. Uh, are we discussing after that or? Uh, because it's getting longer now. Yeah, I think so, the time is kind of running out. We, we don't have too much time left. So yes, yeah, so let let's me talk about that. Yeah. Let me go on to these are the, you know, obviously impact of comorbid conditions. This, uh, you can see the risk factors add up. Um, again, this was, this was suggested by Dr. Sabani and uh, Dr. Jaffer about how the ICU structure could, be, could have an effect on your treatment. Um, lung ultrasound is a great op opportunity as uh, Dr. Mosin described in assessing fluid balance and need for diuretic in these patients. So here's a nice infographic of how to use that modality from the intensive care society. And again, this is a shared protocol for remdesivir based on the small data we have. So recovery trial, so here we go. Uh, the only thing that comes out of this, uh, I suppose, if uh, I ask you want to comment on the dexamethasone portion. I mean, or, or steroid in general. Obviously, I mean, this, uh, my, my question is, uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, very good study and very good study and good size-wise study also. And we immediately actually uh, start using that protocol uh, here in New Jersey also, and I think most of the world also. Uh, I think I particularly like the fact that the dose is not too high, and it's good enough to prevent the uh, cytokine release or other inflammatory response. At the same time, the complication from high-dose steroids are not seen then. 
My question is because luckily we are not seeing that many patients here in New Jersey now. And so our experience for the last, or last month or so is much less as compared to other places, fortunately. So are we seeing less uh, cytokines, uh, uh, inflammatory response so since we started using steroids this dose? And also are we using dose in a less number of patients as compared to what we're using before? Just uh, want to have the experience of other colleagues. So what is uh, Dr. Kaleem and Dr. Kabani? So, um, I don't know. I, uh, I cannot answer because volume uh, uh, also in Maryland is much less. Uh, uh, so uh, now giving you my personal experience is going to be difficult to shed any light, but I would definitely like to comment on this slide. Uh, and uh, there is a ten tendency in our healthcare professionals in general that if some medication is expensive or fancy and new coming and less data, we try to jump on that and spend thousands of dollars. If somebody, something which is penny dirt cheap, we always keep questioning and bring up, put our head of very, you know, careful investigator. I think we need to change our attitude. Look at this sheet here. This hydroxychloroquine, this is taken out from the memory of healthcare professional on the basis of a flaw study published by a very small unknown company in the US who has a shady background. And then even FDA and World Health Organization has banned this thing. Dr. Jaffer, your institution has done a study in uh, Henry Ford and uh, where they have used, they published a positive data of hydroxychloroquine. And yeah. we don't hear anything from anybody. They have shown mortality outcome better. They have shown uh, the length of stays better and their study was not short. There was prospect, not a prospective study, retrospective study, but they mm -hmm. have seen this thing. Same thing with dexamethasone. It's over, this data is fantastic, but somehow we prefer more TOSI, we prefer more remdesivir because they are more fancy nematite. Uh, this is my unfortunate way I think. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So I agree with you in, uh, in, in part because, uh, you know, when we started uh, taking care of these patients in our ICU in, uh, in Detroit, Michigan, we had uh, early rise, like end of March and April, we had patients full. At one time, we had 110 patients on the ventilator at DMC. And uh, we, were, we were using methylprednisolone five days and uh, one milligram per kg for every single patient who was intubated. But I think uh, overall, uh, these medications needs to be started early. For example, remdesivir, you know, it's gonna affect the viral replication. But if the viral has, virus has already replicated and caused the damage in the lung, you're not gonna prevent anything more than. So it has to be started early. Same thing is steroids. If you want to start these steroids, they needs to be started early so that you can prevent that inflammatory response that the patients are going to have. I'm not gonna wait for that inflammatory response to kick in and then I start the medication. You know, there was a time like 30 years ago when patients used to develop pneumonia and nobody used to start patients on antibiotics un until the cultures are back. And the culture is coming back 48 hours later, and then you start, oh, the patient has MRSA, and we need to add vancomycin. So 48 hours are already gone. So now what we do, we start broad spectrum antibiotics early, and then you de-escalate de later. And same thing, we need to use the same methodology in these patients, that we want to reduce the inflammatory response, whichever medication work, early on the on virus replication, we need to start those. If we can prevent a inflammatory response by using steroids and low dose, either it's a methylprednisolone or it is a hydro, uh, hydrocortisone or dexamethasone, whichever we want to use. Why dexamethasone is being utilized? Because it does have a more anti-inflammatory property as compared to uh, methylpred and and uh, and the other one, anyhow. So, yeah, 
So, so you want to make sure that's, that's, this is what my bias is, that I want to start these medications early if I have it. The problem is that we never had remdesivir in our institution in March. So none of our patients received remdesivir or, uh, or Toki or anything. So every patient received hydroxychloroquine. We started them on, uh, on methylprednisolone when they got uh, on more than 60% oxygen and they were uh, getting ready to be intubated. And uh, only antibiotics were given to those patients who had a you know, positive BAL. Otherwise, no antibiotics were used. So based on uh, some small studies or information we have, if a patient in ICU and patient in uh, septic shock because of COVID, in that case, uh, my own choice of uh, steroids would be a little bit different. I would put on uh, hydrocortisone as compared to a dexamethasone. Uh, because it responses better to high potential because it has more uh, mineral corticoid effect. Uh, actually, dexamethasone has the least mineral corticoid effect as compared to even uh, prednisone also. It has more anti-inflammatory effect though. Mm -hmm. Agree. Let me ask a question to all, all of you regarding steroids before we move on. Is there any patient in COVID-19 presentation in the ICU or pre-ICU who you would not give steroids now? And what, what would be the indication? So, so the, the, ahead, the only real indication for steroids or hydrocortisone is somebody who has been on steroids before. And then it comes down to the choice, uh, what are you trying to prevent? And whichever medication we are using, they needs to be done at the right time. And uh, even uh, if you're going to be using uh, either remdesivir or toki or, uh, or steroids or antibiotics, you know, I know that there was a time or there is still time where people are putting everything together in a, on a patient and making sure and hoping that something will work. But that's not the way it should be. Again, uh, using it for the proper indication. So for example, now anybody who has an oxygen requirement um, uh, uh, is at least from the data that we have should be given a course of dexamethasone according to several, uh, according to the COVID trial. Yeah. One of the questions people have concerns is diabetic patients. So how would you handle the dexamethasone dosage and their diabetes? Do Dr. Gali, I was just about to address that because there is actually a paper by an endocrinologist by the name of uh, uh, Sadhu, uh, Arachna Sadhu, and I think it's in the New England Journal, but I'm going to, to find it and share it with you, that she's talked about uh, glucose control in these COVID patients. And I think the important point is that it, if they're going to benefit by steroids, we have to give it to them, but at the same time, be extremely careful about how we control their blood sugars. It's a 10 day period they can be controlled with IV insulin and you may have to upscale your IV insulin uh, for that. So that is why, and I actually personally happen to know this lady. So I called her and asked her, she, this paper was published by her and somebody at uh, 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 Beth Israel. And so I asked her, how does she recommend? And she said, we want to be called, the endocrinologist, we want to be there and we want to be called on these patients. So, so um, yeah. <laughs> I see Dr. Kaleem's uh, reaction to that, but I think it's, it's an important point to remember because sometimes we can start and forget and the glucoses can go up very high and cause more harm than good for a while. And we do monitor oh, glucose. The, I think that uh, particularly I have experienced with some people in Pakistan, uh, not every patient uh, need to be put on a dexamethasone, particularly patients who are not hospitalized and they don't have any respiratory issue or oxygen saturation is not decreased. Even they have fever um, or something initial, some symptoms for COVID and COVID positive, but uh, not every patient need to be started on uh, dexamethasone. I totally agree. I think uh, people who are having uh, infiltrate on chest X-ray, shortness of breath and hypoxia, I think the best data is in patient uh, who are hypoxic starting early and doing with their DEXA is, is the name of the game. 
And in the Pakistan scenario, there's actually a case that we came across of a friend of mine who's probably in this panel will be able to tell you more that the patient was being used steroids, had no diabetes, and then later on we found out that the blood sugar was like 300. So if, if this is to be done in the context of Pakistan home management, then a glucometer should accompany that dexamethasone and a check of the blood sugar should accompany that as well. Well, let's start. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, on that. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a little clearer now. Now, uh, another question that's very commonly asked by uh, colleagues in Pakistan is about when to start to see which patients would benefit, and um, you know, when to start it, and when it is when is it too late to start it, and which patients you will not consider it. So, of course, the question mark from the current data, some promising results, but it's not certainly as strong data as uh, the, you know, dexamethasone. So what is your opinion? And I, I believe Avas has some experience with, um, with those, please, if you can start. I mean, we were facing a lot of patients before this dexamethasone recovery trial came. So at that time, our approach was, again, it goes for all the medication we're using that early start is always better, don't wait too long. So if patient is <clears throat> admitted or patient has symptoms, very, very obvious that patient going to have or already have uh, inflammatory response. And then at that time we were giving uh, toxi if all the inflammatory response are positive and aggressively like going up day or two, we won't wait too long. Uh, so all like uh, if uh, ferritin and uh, if uh, D-dimer, everything is going up, so we will use early. And uh, sometime uh, we use even before giving steroids. Uh, but now our experience is less uh, because we are giving less uh, TOSI because we are starting the dexamethasone pretty much everybody, every patient who is coming with a little bit of respiratory status. And our limited experience so far showing that we need to give less TOSI uh, in patients who are started steroid early. And when it's too late, I mean, obviously, when patient is uh, intubated and at that time, you can still give that, but I think it's too late. Uh, you're just uh, wasting uh, money on the, those patients and they are really full-blown ARDS and uh, intubated. Uh, it still could make some differences. Still, patient became to that stage very early stage, like four to five days. If patient is there for two weeks and they have in this condition at that time, it's too late. Mm -hmm. I agree. I have not used TOSI for any of our patients. As I said before, even remdesivir was not available for us at that time. And TOSI was uh, even the worst. So we used a lot more steroids early than uh, anything else. Hydroxychloroquine, steroids, that was our main treatment. But again, let me add one more thing that, again, if patient, some patient uh, present very aggressive uh, presentation, very aggressive, uh, look like they have an inflammatory response, those patients actually do get benefit from uh, TOSI uh, within starting uh, like two, three days in uh, starting the symptoms. If they have fever, they have very high inflammatory response, uh, three, four days into starting symptoms, uh, those patients definitely don't wait too long. They do respond very well to TOSI. TOSI is a very good medication uh, for uh, some patients. Yeah, and in Pakistan setting, I think uh, the thing to uh, be careful about TOSI is that there is a TB endemic and there are, uh, and then any immunosuppressive medication, including TOSI, uh, has to be uh, way in, in the presence of what the patient condition is. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Governor Pakistan, Ministry of uh, National Health Services has published a guideline. I think they change on a weekly basis about uh, what to add or not. I think their guideline is kind of pretty, uh, pretty standard and look very reasonable that if you have uh, ferritin is more than 2,000 or, uh, you know, if you're doing the ferritin uh, more than 1,000 and uh, 24 hours later, you're repeating it, it is high. And if your D-dimer is up, uh, if your, uh, you know, LDH is uh, more than 300 uh, in addition to the ferritin. So those are the guidelines they have published that thing. I think sticking to those guidelines, especially in the patient is rapidly progressing uh, from the inflammatory marker point of view, clinical perspective. And I think giving that thing is reasonable. Let me ask the panel 
about two other modalities that are available or at least somewhat available. Uh, one is convalescent plasma and the other which have which we found out some institutions in Pakistan are using uh, with some success is therapeutic plasma exchange. So not replacing it with convalescent plasma, but with, with uh, fresh frozen plasma and just getting rid of the uh, supposedly of the mediators and inflammation. So what what is your opinion on those two? And this will be, I think, our last uh, topic before we finish. So from the, uh, as Dr. Jaffer mentioned about the early use of medication in COVID, I think that is, uh, I think we need to understand what each uh, modality is going to do. So these two modalities are working two different ways. A convalescent plasma giving in the form of something to help bind the virus with the antibodies. So it definitely, uh, if you have enough uh, uh, antibody titer uh, and then you figure out how to deal with this, uh, then yes, in the early stage, you can give that. But unfortunately, nobody knows that. Every day we hear some new studies that how the antibody response of different patient population is different. If somebody has a minor disease, their response is going to be different. If somebody has severe disease, is going to be a little different. So there's no standardization. Uh, so the effectiveness, I think, has to be looked at. The Mayo Clinic is doing a huge study. They have published their data of the safety, uh, I think, about a month ago. But uh, there's no study yet as far as uh, whether the outcome is going to be. Now, a replacement therapy of the uh, plasma replacement exchange well, basically is going to help in terms of taking out all the inflammatory markers from the body and putting some other with the convalescent plasma later on. Uh, it might have impact, but uh, so far the published data, we don't have from Pakistan, but there's a list of it is small studies, has some promise, but they're very, very small studies. So that's the, that's the best I can say. You know, the, uh, when Fessel presented, uh, you know, their at Methodist uh, Houston data, and yes. I think he, he he does have a large number of patients where they used uh, convalescent plasma early in the disease. And I think they, maybe next time we can bring him also on and uh, he can talk about it in more details, what they did, because he does have positive results from it. So listening to him might be also helpful. Yeah, sure. And he has, we have a lot of experience with that. Hey, but again, that's very, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, that study was a, which he presented, it was a small study. You know, the number of patients was, I think, 28, uh, not more than that. Yeah, that was uh, a long time ago, but they do have a lot more, uh, much bigger number now. Yes, okay, the then, yeah, the last data, which was, uh, I think, shared, that was a safety data uh, of the uh, no, person plasma. It was not the uh, effectiveness and measure outcome data. So yeah. I think we are still waiting for the outcome data. Safety data was very good. So it was, it was kind of very nice to see that there's no significant problem. So that that's leads me to uh, the question, has any of you used convalescent plasma or therapeutic plasma exchange in any of your COVID-19 critically ill patients? I mean, convalescent plasma we're using pretty commonly here, even now. Actually, it's one of the few very almost, uh, not almost, uh, patient, but many patients we are using it when the patient comes. But uh, plasma exchange, we have not. Convalescent, we have used that, um, no plasma exchange. And overall, your results have been encouraging or not, or disappointing? What would you say? I mean, uh, from convalescent plasma, I think uh, we are, I mean, encouraging, I would say. I mean, cautiously, I would say, encouraging, and we are keep using it. So very uh, interesting data that the military hospital in Rawalpindi presented on yes. therapeutic plasma exchange. Yep. Mm -hmm. They have a very strong foundation in pathology and the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology is a premier uh, laboratory. So they have that support of kind of uh, providing the plasma and, and all the components. So I, I was fascinated that they had these results and I hope they share it with the rest of the world but what was your impression from, uh, you know, just looking at the physiological concept behind it? And uh, is this just another one of those small? I mean, we, we use it 
being a nephrologist, we use a plasma exchange for many other indication. And so with that experience, I would be very, very cautious. I have to be really convinced with some hard data to use that practice. I don't know if any of you were at the uh, meeting that was uh, done in Pakistan with Indus Hospital as well as Dr. Iqbal. I think you might have been there uh, with Indus Hospital and then there was the uh, urology transplant. Uh, uh, yes, SIUT. Yes, suit. Uh, and uh, they presented, Indus Hospital presented quite a bit of data. The only thing that I found, and they did have some, some positive results, the only thing that I found uh, was that those patients had been used, had been again given everything else, like dexamethasone, TOSI. You don't know what was. And it was a retrospective study. So I think, again, uh, it is being used in Pakistan. One concern that I found in Pakistan that was expressed to me by some of the physicians, and I've discussed this before, is that the uh, and these institutions that are like CMH or INDAS, they have certain strict protocols and guidelines, but the blood bank is not centralized like it is in the US. And people are going in and giving people, and people are getting it without real uh, infection control procedures and procedures, the quality control procedures. So in Pakistan, you have to qualify that it has to be done under control conditions and not at, at an institution that can, that we are not sure the source of the plasma is. Uh, is good and and safe. It's a safety issue more than anything. Right. So well, we we await. Uh, of course, as this whole pandemic evolves, we wait for the more data from our uh, colleagues in different societies. I I think. Uh, is there any other comments? Would you, before we end this session, we've gone over. But I I I've, I've been fascinated by the discussion. I think we learned a lot. I learned a lot, and I hope our attendees did as well. So I want to thank you all. And if you want to provide the final thoughts. There was a question, I think it was about Dazavir, that uh, it needs to be diluted in normal saline. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for picking that up. Right. Thank, thank you very much. That's nice. Thank you nice. very much, everybody. And uh, Valid Saab, thank you very much for your help and for all the attendees who stayed all this time listening to us and thank you for your questions and we will have a break in our saturday case discussions next weekend for the eid, eid al-adha